Good morning. Thank you uh, for all coming out today. Um, you know, a tough day yesterday, and as you know um, from the press release and our announcement yesterday, I uh, have relieved Coach Jinks of his uh, head coaching responsibilities here at BGSU. Um, defensive coordinator Carl Pellini has agreed to serve as the interim head coach for the remainder of the season, and you'll get to hear from Coach Pellini here in a second. Um, regardless of what anyone says, this is not an easy decision, uh, one that I do not take lightly. As the press release mentioned, um, 11 coaching families, uh, 112 student athletes, numerous support staff members are affected by this decision that I made. Um, in addition to that, I called 11 2019 commits last night uh, to give them the news and talk to them. It's affected their lives as well. Again, do not take this lightly. Coach Jinks and his family have done a lot of great things in the Bowling Green community um, and for BGSU. Uh, Coach Jinks has taken some shots on and off the field, uh, some unfair and fair. Um, he's handled it with a lot of class, a lot of dignity, and I again thank him for his professionalism yesterday and uh, wish him well for all his efforts here at BGSU. With that said, President Rogers and I came to this decision um, for the best interest of our student athletes, our football program, and the university. Again, there's a lot of factors that go into this decision, and what I kept coming back to was our student athletes and what's right and what's fair for them. At the same time, I understand that this decision weighs on them, brings out a lot of emotions for them, um, but we're working with them. Uh, we'll get through this transition. And then yesterday, first to the 10 players that are on our leadership council and to the entire team. We talked about this decision and how we best can move forward. And I know it's going to be tough for them, but uh, the focus should be on Ohio University and trying to go 1-0 this week. I talked to him about playing for the senior class. Um, this senior class has been through a lot here at BGSU um, and taking some ownership, looking every, looking every, everybody look in the mirror and see what you can do to help this program. And I, and I included myself in that as well. But we look forward to the rest of the season under Coach Pelini. And uh, with that, I'll open it up for some questions uh, before we get to Coach Pelini. Bob, why now? Why not wait till the end of the season? Yeah, that's uh, something I struggled with, quite honestly. And uh, you know, I kept going back and forth with it. And just it ultimately came down um, in the best interest of our student athletes. Um, I felt it was the right time to do it at this time of the season. How much did the boosters weigh into this decision? Not at all. Um, you know, this is a decision that uh, President Rogers and I have contemplated. Um, we talked, we discussed. Obviously, there's many factors in it. Um, you know, regardless of what um, has been said, um, no one has stepped up and offered me money to help th through this transition. Um, so that did not have a factor in this. We just did it in the best interest of our, again, our student athletes, the university, and the football program. Let me, I want to follow up on that then. So the buyout, obviously we all know that Mike is due about a million or so. Um, who is paying the buyout then? We're taking university uh, athletic resources and no education or general fee uh, resources will be used for this, um, but we'll take it from athletics resources. And you know, let's not forget that uh, per his contract, uh, Coach Jenks and I did talk about the mitigation of it. If he can go out and uh, gain employment, that will lessen our, uh, our payout to him. Um, but you know, the, so the final number is not known at this time. Um, you know, again, I think Coach Jenks is uh, a heck of a call player, um, and he'll find another opportunity, um, and that will help us through this process. Bob, did you have a moment when you came to the conclusion that, in your opinion, that this was not going to turn around? Not one particular moment. Um, you know, I keep analyzing the situation, kept thinking about what we're missing, um, what these players need uh, to be successful, and ultimately, like I said, you know, I just felt it was time to make this decision. In the past, this has been a great program. It has been a winning program here. What qualities do you want out of the next head coach? that could make it such a gap? Yeah, the, you know, what we look for in all of our head coaches is being a great leader. Um, these student athletes want to be mentored, want to learn. 
um, be a great leader, you know, have proven success um, at a program uh, that uh, is like BGSU um, and mentor and guide these kids through, you know, those formidable years, 18 to 22 year old kids. The timeline is obviously not ideal, as you mentioned. Um, with the game this week and then signing day is about two months, do you have a timeline with how you want to fill the position? Do you have a date in mind? Do you want to do it before signing day? Yes, definitely. We want to definitely do it before signing day. Um, not a particular date in mind, but uh, a lot of factors go into that. Um, but we will move as quickly as we can, but uh, respect uh, a lot of people's timing of this. Obviously, we have five games left this season, and uh, you know we'll move as quickly as we can, but find the right person for the job. Mike seemed a little different after the game Saturday. Did, did he have an idea that it was possibly coming? I don't know. Um, I can't speak for Mike, but I know he was he was hurt by that loss. I mean, it was a tough loss, you know, uh, tough hard fought game, and that's what we talked about is uh, with our student athletes yesterday. Is you know that we are there, we're close, and that's you know a Western Michigan team, and the week before against Toledo, two teams that are you know well respected in our conference, and the amount of effort and work uh, that goes into those games is is a lot, and. To not be able to finish it uh, was frustrating for everybody. Can well, you speak to the personal side a little bit of, of sitting across the table with somebody that you know, you've worked with that you like and have to tell them that you know, it's not going to work out anymore? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I'll talk to uh, my meeting with Mike and, uh, you know, uh, it didn't go as well as I had liked. Um, obviously, emotional. Um, he believes 100% that he's the man for the job, and uh, that's what I want out of the head coach. I, uh, I was glad he didn't come in and say, yeah, okay, thanks. Um, you know, he, was, he thought I'm wrong, and he probably still thinks I'm wrong. Um, so that was a tough conversation. Um, but he understands the business of it, and uh, I did call him last night, and we talked again. Um, told him a few things that I didn't, wasn't able to mention in that meeting because of how it went. Um, and we talked about it, and you know, it's it it's a hard situation when uh, you know he's done so much behind the scenes that people don't realize. Um, and he was, you know, he had the best interest in the university and the student athletes in mind, and uh, so he was just disappointed that he doesn't get a chance to see it through the end. There were a couple outfield issues as well, Bob. Uh, was this just a decision that? You know, you got to look at the totality of the situation, you know, off the field, you know, obviously, uh, you know, we had some hiccups this past summer, but again, you know, uh, we worked through those. Mike handled those in appropriate fashion, quick fashion, um, and, you know, demanded that from his players. Um, again, you know, we were dealing with 18 to 22 year old kids who are going to make mistakes. Um, you know, but the totality of the situation um, led us to the decision yesterday. Um, you know, but it wasn't one incident um, that happened um, during the season or off the field or whatever. Um, but in total, you know, everything from the performance on the field um, to all the other factors that go in, into this decision. You've mentioned the financial situation a lot, whether BG's last in football budget. Obviously, that gets, that's a negative, but there's a lot of positives, too. Is BG football a good job to you, and what, what makes it a good job? 100%. It's a great job. Um, you know, we talked about that. It, it's, it is what it is. However, wherever we are in our budget, and we, meaning us alumni, us fans, the donors, we all need to support this program. And that's the only way it's going to get better. Um, but this is a great job. This is a great community. Uh, it's a great college town where students can come to school um, and have a great experience. It's a great football program with rich history, um, great fan support, great facilities. Um, I think it's a great opportunity for anyone. And are you expecting supporters to step up and help, help fund this? Or, I mean, you mentioned it's not going to come from the university, but when it is, I, I guess it's hard. How do you get those funds without... I thought you had checks in hand for me today, David. Yes, um, the, the donors want to give to a program 
and they want to see their funds used in a way that's going to help the program. And unfortunately, I've been part of this situation in San Diego State, moving from Chuck Long to Brady Hoke. Um, it is not an easy conversation to have donors to say, help us with this problem, fix this problem. Um, they want to be part of a solution going forward. You know? um, so that's our focus, is what, we can do, what can we do to move forward? What projects can we help this football program? We have a weight room renovation that we know if we get that off the ground, that's going to help us in recruiting. Um, so we're looking forward. And, and you know, we, we feel that we still have five games in the season that can help define this season and move forward in the best way that we can. And obviously the coaching market's getting more and more out of control each year. Are you guys prepared to, if the right candidate is available in conjunction with the supporters, to step up significantly the financial commitment of the coach? Yes, um, President Rogers and I had that conversation. At the end of the day, you know, this decision may be, it is what it is, but the decisions that we have moving forward are going to affect this program for the next coach, the next group of recruits. Um, and we want this program to be a uh, leader in our athletic department. And we realize that uh, we need to invest in the program. Um, we need to find donors and alumni and fans to give, to buy tickets, uh, to be corporate partners uh, for this program, for sure. Will Coach Bellini be evaluated as a possible candidate? Yes, um, you know, we are moving forward, um, Coach Pliny, um, with the five games remaining, and we will consider a lot of factors in our decision, and Coach will be part of that decision. Chris oh. Brady, has had coaching experience important to you, Bob, moving forward? Um, you know, this is going to be my first football hire. Um, the coaches that we have hired at BGSU here, um, I would say they do have that in their background, head coaching experience. There's something to be said about um, having that experience, being the person in charge and making the decision. Um, so that will definitely be one of the factors as we decide on. It's not going to, I'm not going to say, yes, that has to be the deciding factor, um, but certainly that's, that is one consideration that we'll put into this job. Bob, it's been about two weeks since that article was written with the anonymous boosters. Um, how much did that weigh on you? And how much more difficult did that make your job as an athletic director? Great question. Um, you know, I thought it was unfair, um, especially to our student athletes. And I know Coach Jinks addressed that in, in his article or uh, in his press conference. Um, I didn't understand why it needed to be written, why those anonymous sources needed to say those things. Um, I don't know how it helped BGSU in our current situation and supporting these student athletes um, through this. And you know, if, if you're with us, be with us. Um, and you know, as a family, we have tough conversations at the dinner table. And it stays at the dinner, dinner table. And so, um, yeah, I, I just didn't like the article whatsoever. Now, the players are probably <clears throat> arguably the most impacted of anyone. How do you make sure as a community that they can, you know, keep this on track the rest of the way? Yeah, we've, uh, you know, so we met with the leadership council yesterday, which is about 10 student athletes um, representing all different uh, classes of the football team and then met with the team. And we talked about, you know, what this means for them, obviously the emotions that's going on right now. Uh, we've offered support um, through, you know, uh, a number of sources, um, you know, being there to talk to them and help them through this transition. You know, this is 18 to 22 year old kids um, that have faced a lot of adversity. Um, this is another adversity that they're facing right now. And how do we best navigate the road moving forward? You know, and I asked the head or the, you know, Coach Pliny and the rest of the assistant coaches that they need to lead these young men uh, through this transition. And they need to be professional, they need to be positive, and we will get through this together. How have they taken it from your perspective, the players? The players? You know, these, they're kids, they're resilient. Uh, they're probably taking it better than I am. Um, they're probably taking it better than the assistant coaches are. Um, so I think, you know, they went through their walkthrough yesterday. I uh, uh, talked to a few of them, and. and you know, they were, they were in pretty good spirits. 
How much weight did the Caleb Wright situation play into this where football staff learned to stay back in the NFL? It didn't. Um, you know, we talked about that situation, and, and to be clear, Nick, uh, we did leave a certified athletic trainer back in Atlanta because I did have people ask me, you didn't leave anybody? I said, no, we did leave somebody. And, then, and so just want to make sure that we do make that clear that there was a certified athletic trainer. But yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we missed on the ele human element. Uh, Coach Jinx and I talked about that. Um, we definitely, uh, you know, again, at that moment in time, the biggest thing on our mind was making sure we had the medical attention that this kid needed. Um, from there, once uh, we transferred the medical care to the EMTs and then to the emergency room, you know, could we have done more? You know, looking back at it, I think we could have. Um, but did it have a factor in this decision? No. Did you go to the Georgia Tech game? I did. Why did you not say that? I had that same question of myself. Um, you know, I, I, in hindsight, seeing and hearing from the parents, um, you know, should I have been the one that stayed back? Do you take, how much blame should you take or your office? You know, because a lot of it looks like it's on Mike and the staff for not staying right. back, but here you and whoever else was there from, you know, the administration yeah. to stay back. Yeah, that's uh, something that we talked about. You know, is, is the head coach the right person to, be there, should have been a position coach, should it have been an administrator. And when you're in the moment, and we talked about this, um, we, need, we need our protocols um, are what they are. But when you're in the moment and you're dealing with the situation, I don't think that we were thinking completely clear, clearly. And having someone off-site who's not in the situation that can make sure that we're addressing all those issues um, and say, all right, which administrator is staying? You know, maybe it's not a head coach or uh, an assistant coach, but it is administrator. So I think we all can do in this whole in this whole football program. We can all do better. I guess it's confusing because given that arguably the biggest story in college football this season, given what's going on at Maryland, why <clears throat> someone from your office probably wouldn't stay. Yeah. So. Um, you know, some of the factors that went into it, you know, before or right when we were on the bus, you know, he, um, we got word that he was stabilized um, before we even left. They were talking about discharging him. Um, so, and we had a certified athletic trainer there, his parents were there, and we felt he was in the care of medical professionals and he was well taken care of. In hindsight, could we have done better? Absolutely. <coughs> Any further? All right. I'm going to bring up, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Coach Planey, uh, obviously our defensive coordinator, 20-plus uh, year veteran, um, bachelor's in English literature and two master's degrees. Not sure you'll you'll see that um, in a coach uh, anywhere else here uh, elsewhere. Uh, in his short time here, he's earned the respect of the coaches and student athletes. Uh, knowledge for, of the game, his attention to detail, his preparation, his leadership, his consistent teaching and mentoring of these young men. And with that, I welcome interim head coach, Carl Pelini. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. You know, I, I, it's difficult under the circumstances. Mike and I were friends. Um, we worked closely together. He gave me an opportunity, and, and I'll always be indebted to him for that. Um, shortly after Bob and Kit met with Mike yesterday, they called me into the office and talked to me about uh, their decision. And um, after the initial shock wore off, talked to me about uh, stepping up as the interim head coach. Um, I immediately accepted because the most important thing to me at this moment is our players and the young men in that locker room. And my intention as the interim head coach is to keep things moving in a positive direction, um, to focus on micro changes that I think can make us better, 
to keep, uh, keep the morale up, keep the routine in place. Um, and I met with them this morning. I uh, met with them yesterday. Uh, everybody was in a little bit of shock and, and everybody was uh, kind of dealing with their own feelings. So I brought them back this morning. We had a little bit longer visit. And I talked to them about um, something I, you know, talk about to our players often is the difference between a river and a flood. And rivers are powerful things because everybody's moving in one direction. Um, in floods, the water starts seeping outside of the banks and it loses its power. And I talked to them about that. And what we need now as a family, as a group, as a program, is to all be on the same page and all keep moving forward in the same direction in a positive way. Very little distractions, um, stay focused on their studies, on their day-to-day -day routine as a student athlete, and on Ohio University. And we're gonna roll up our sleeves, we're gonna prepare for Ohio U, and we're gonna put the best product on the field that we can put. Um, we're gonna be there for our players. Um, I told them I have an open door if anyone wants to discuss anything. Um, and I know it's a difficult time. I've been through this before as a head coach. I've been through it on this level as well um, when I was at Nebraska and Coach Solich got let go. So I understand the uncertainty in their minds, the uncertainty in the minds of the staff. Um, but the bottom line is what I've learned over my years as a football coach and as a professional is that you just control what you can control. And what we can control is how we work day to day to prepare for Ohio University. Focus on the academic side of the program, focus on the athletic side of the program, and just continue to put our nose to the grindstone and keep working to become a better football program and to achieve some of the goals that we set out to achieve at the beginning of the season. Um, with that, you know, I'll take any questions that you guys have. How will your day-to-day -day operations change and how will things change for you now? Um, well, it'll be difficult, you know, to accept the head coach's responsibilities at the same time um, running the defense. Uh, but I've got some really qualified guys in that staff room with me and I'm going to have to lean on them a little bit, um, spend some long hours preparing for this game um, while maintaining you know, control of the program at the same time. So how will it change? You know, as you become a head coach, you know, usually in the ideal situation, you've got three or four months to prepare for spring football. And once spring is done, another three or four months before the season uh, gets to you. So you really have a chance to install your program and, and do things. So what I've tried to look at, and I mentioned the word micro changes, but small changes with I, which I think culturally will get us on the same page to where I think we need to be. Um, talk to some of the players about that. Just little operational things. And, and I think the worst thing I could do right now is try to overhaul the program in a week. Um, instead, I've spent last night really evaluating how we do things day to day and trying to uh, look at small changes that I can make to kind of get us pointed in the right direction. Um, quickly without overwhelming the players with change. When you took this job this, this off season, um, it, it has, have things been more difficult to fix than what maybe you anticipated? Um, yes, uh, it has been, but I, I'll say this. I mean, uh, I believe in the system, in the scheme. It's been successful other places. Um, and we as a staff and, and as, as players, you know, I, I applaud their effort. They're, they're focused, they're locked in. We rolled up our sleeves in January and we got to work. And, and you know, I can honestly say that you know, I put my head on the pillow at night knowing that, that I've done my best and, and I've worked my tail off to uh, get us to where we are. I can see improvement. You know, I think we're on the verge um, and we need to figure out a way uh, to get us over the top. And, and that's true as a team. You know, it's something that I focused on in my discussion with the players today. Um, Bob mentioned we took two outstanding football teams to the wire the last two weeks, but we still fell short, and that's unacceptable. And so I talked to them about honest self-evaluation. What is it? Um, 
we're shooting ourselves in the foot at times, making untimely mistakes, um, unable to finish. You know, what is it that is causing that? And I think I have to look at that as a program and as a team, what can we do to be successful in those situations? But I think each player and each coach has to look at those situations as well and, and evaluate themselves honestly. And, and what can the individual do to make us more successful in those situations? And, and if we truly evaluate it um, honestly um, and make those changes, you know, I think we have an opportunity still to get over the top and, and to start to um, not just be successful in those situations, but embrace them. And, and I think that the first one is the most difficult. And I've always said, um, to establish a culture, you're going to get close, you're going to get close, you're going to get close. And then it's going to come where you pull one of those out. And once you do, that snowball will start rolling. So we're still at that point where we need to pull out that first one. Um, so we need, to, we need to figure out how to do that. And, and once we do it, I think we can get this culture going in the direction that we all want it to go. For all the adjustments that you might need to make here, signing day is about two months away now. So how aggressively does the staff plan to recruit uh, the rest of the season? Very aggressively. You know, all hands on deck. Um, um, we have a number of commitments already that Bob mentioned. Um, we'll continue to build those relationships. Um, at this point, most of the feedback we've gotten from those recruits is positive, that they're committed to the university. Um, but if there is a guy or two that walks away because of the coaching change and because of the uncertainty, then we'll go out and find quality student athletes to replace them. Um, one thing, you know, I've been here a short time. Uh, but I love this university. I love this town. It's been a great transition for me, for my family. Um, just a great experience. And, and there's good people here. And I grew up in the state of Ohio. Um, and I know the success and the history of Bowling Green. And one thing I told Bob and Kit yesterday is, despite the struggles in the last couple years, when you get out into these schools, there is a very high opinion of Bowling Green football in terms of the student athletes and how they perceive this program. And it's not a difficult place to recruit to. Um, and so, especially locally, especially in the state of Ohio and, and Western Pennsylvania and Eastern Michigan, um, I think you know, we're on track to putting together an outstanding recruiting class. Um, and we're going to work hard to see that through and make sure that gets done. That sounds like you would like this job full time. Will you treat these next six weeks like a, like a job interview? Um, I don't know any other way than to put my heart and soul into my job and what I've been asked to do. Um, again, control what I can control. And what I can control is doing the best possible job that I can do um, in what I've been asked to do here. And um, you know, from that point on, you know, we we'll just have to let the chips fall where they may. Touched on it with the reputation this place has, but what do you make Bowling Green a, a good job? What do I think makes Bowling Green a good job? The people, number one. The people that are here in the athletic department, the community, uh, the supporters, the alumni, the football alumni who are here every weekend, um, the boosters, everybody I've come in contact with. One thing that I'll say that really was, was eye-opening and, and have, again, having grown up in Ohio, but not, you know, I, I coached in the Mac at Ohio University, so I had some interaction with Bowling Green, but the idea of how much people love this place and how passionate they are about this place is really striking, uh, especially for someone who is looking at it from the outside. Uh, but there's there are the people in this building, the people on this campus, the students, they love it here. Our student athletes love it here. The greatest selling points we have as recruiters is when we get those kids on campus and they get around our student athletes who love being students here. Um, it's, it is striking and it's, it's unusual and it's not like that very many places, I can tell you. And all the places I've been, this is unique in that regard. People love Bowling Green State University. And, and I can see why after being here a short time. It's, uh, it's, 
a passionate group um, that love this place and, and it's infectious. Carl, you're jumping back into this role for the first time in about five years. Um, what valuable experiences did you learn last time you think it might help you here? Um, you know, when I got to FAU, they had, I don't think they won a game the, the year before. And, and I was, um, you know, the most important thing for me at that point was, was the cultural change and, and getting the, the guys to buy in and to see themselves as winners um, because they were winners and, and just the way they approached the game every day. And, and regardless of how that ended, um, I take a lot of satisfaction in seeing where that program is now and knowing that, that I helped to lay the foundation for their success that's come in recent years. Um, I learned a lot about myself, you know, and, and I, I didn't always handle things uh, perfectly, but I am one that, that looks back at everything I've done in my career, and I go back to all, all the way back to my time as a high school head coach early in my career. Um, I do look at myself honestly, and I'm, and I'm able to admit mistakes, change, um, lean on people, ask for help, um, get, a, get a consensus rather than rolling with an iron fist. And, I, and I, think, I think those are all things that help me grow as a person, most importantly, but, but as a coach as well. Do you see at least a little irony in the fact that your first opponent is Frank Solich? Um, Frank gave me my first opportunity in college football. Uh, we're very close. You know, I love the guy. He's a good man and a good person. And there's no secret to the success he's had. Uh, his consistency and, and the way he competes and appreciates um, his challenges every day is, uh, is something to watch. And so I learned a lot from Frank about being a coach. Um, look forward to squaring off against him. Uh, regardless of uh, regardless of our relationship, you know, I, I, I mentioned this morning. Um, I think back about when I was at University of Nebraska and we were playing Oklahoma, and one of my best friends, Bob Stoops, was on the opposite sidelines, and we competed like heck against each other. But at the end of the day, at the end of the game, we gave each other a hug before we went to the locker room, and so that's how it's going to be Saturday. Um, he would expect nothing less than than our best shot at him, and and. You know, I feel the same way about him. I know they're going to be prepared to play a good game as well. Have you, talking to, have you talked to Frank in the last 20 hours? No, I have not, no. You mentioned culture a couple of times in regards to here. Um, you feel like there was a culture issue? Um, there's always a culture issue. <laughs> I'll just say that. There's always improvement in that side uh, that can be done. And, and um, the goal is to... Uh, constantly reevaluate that. And, and if there's one thing that I think, uh, being in this role, even if it's just for the next five weeks, um, I think the most important thing, and I, people talk a lot about um, mission statements. And I think in a lot of organizations, you, you make your mission statement, and two years later, you revisit it and rewrite it. All right. But for me, um, as a leader, I think it's really important to understand what culture you seek and who, what your identity, what identity do you want to be and focus everything toward that identity. So every decision you make during the day, every single decision you make during the day, you have to have that identity in mind and it should weigh in on that decision. And if you start to stray from it and if you honestly revisit it again and again and again, you have to decide, do I want to do I, do I want to maintain this identity, or is it time to change a little bit? And so it's always a living thing. You, you're never going to achieve it perfectly, and so you should just always reevaluate it and reevaluate it. Um, so being in this role, I've spent the last 24 hours really thinking about that and, and who I think this program needs to be and, and what what do we need to focus on? And, and, and that needs to be part of every decision I make in the next five weeks. Um, so, yes, but that's not unusual in this job. Maybe fans, coaches would say, despite your best efforts as defensive coordinator, uh, the first half of the season, the defense has continued to struggle in response to it. 
there is a lot of change. Um, and and there, you know, I, I would equate that to, um, I, I knew it would be difficult coming in midstream, you know, and, and typically um, when you come into a new place, you come in with a new staff and, and there's a little bit of a grace period as you build and develop. And you can, you can prepare kids through spring and through camp as well as anybody, but it's different on game day. And the speed at which it happens, um, there's no substitute for it that you can simulate in practice. Um, and it takes some experience in the system. Uh, but I really feel like the last couple weeks we've started to show signs. And, and I feel like we're on the verge of a true understanding of it. Um, I think there's some depth issues, you know, there, there's some fatigue that happens and there's some things about managing the game that we're going to look at as we go forward. But, but I do think that, uh, um, that we have shown improvement. And, and as I said, um, I've never, never worked harder in my life than I've worked the last six months um, to do the best job I can. And I, I felt, uh, you know, I, I, I do take some responsibility for, for what happened. And I, um, I've always said, you know, when you get a flat tire, you don't change the driver. Um, so the coach, the head coach, always takes the full responsibility for the outcome, and yet there's a lot of things that go into it. There's a lot of people that are responsible for what happened. And, and so, um, but ultimately, you, you just have to look at yourself and, and feel good about, about how hard you worked at it and, and how you did the best you could do. And, and we're going to continue that improvement and continue that process. And, and hopefully, within the next few weeks, we start to pull those games out and, and start to develop a winning mentality around here that, that will be infectious and, and will start to snowball for us as we go forward. Have you had a conversation with the rest of the staff? Yes, we uh, visited. I had two different staff meetings yesterday. Um, and one thing I know about these guys, and, and some of them I've only known a short time. Obviously, I had the ability to, to hire the defensive side of the ball when I got here. Um, but they are all good people, hard workers, tremendous work ethic, and, and, and most importantly, a, a tremendous sense of duty. And I think the idea in, in our staff room is that the student athletes are the most important thing to us. And we are going to do everything that we can possibly do to see to it that they experience some success and that they uh, achieve their potential as a football team. Coach has time for one more question. Assume you'll continue to call the defense on game day? Um, yes, and I've, I've kind of gone back and forth on that a little bit, um, but, but I will. And, and at the same time, you know, I'm going to work really hard to spend some time with the offense and kind of, you know, as a defensive guy, play devil's advocate more than anything and get an idea what their game plan is and, and what we feel like we can take advantage of offensively and in special teams. And so I am going to lean on my defensive coaches a little bit. Um, they know the routine. They know how I work and how I operate. And, and they're, they're going to have to step up and, and take some more responsibility, which I know they will, and they'll do it great. They'll do a great job of doing that. Um, and I'm going to try to uh, put myself in a position by Saturday, <laughs> which is a tall order, but I'm going to try to put myself in a position by Saturday that I have a handle on every aspect of the game and, and try to manage that game on Saturday in a way that will help us uh, put our best performance on the field. All right. Thanks, Coach. Okay. Thank you very much.